Hello and welcome back to Ordinary Differential Equations, the video series where we talk about the theory and how to solve differential equations. And indeed, in today's part 19, we talk about the structure of the solution set for a system of linear differential equations. In particular, we first discuss how this solution set looks like for homogeneous systems. However, before we start with that, I first want to thank all the nice people who support the channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. So please check the link in the description to see how you can support me and what additional material you can download. Okay, and then I would say, let's immediately start discussing systems of linear differential equations again. And as always, without loss of generality, we can discuss the first order systems. This means we have a whole vector x, but only the first derivative of this one goes into the equation. And we say that this ODE is linear if we can write it with a matrix function and a vector function. So we have a of t times x plus b of t. And there we have that a of t is always an n times n matrix and b of t is always an n-dimensional vector. Hence the whole thing here is an n-dimensional system and if you see the right hand side as a function with two variables, the variable x comes from Rn. And moreover we don't have a problem with the domain of definition for x because every x in Rn will work on the right hand side. However, for the time variable t one could have a restriction and usually one just talks about a general interval i in R. Hence the two functions a and t here are defined on this interval i. So we have two maps where the one sends t to the matrix at and the other one sends t to the vector bt. And as always we have to assume that these two mappings are continuous ones. But then the whole definition of a system of linear differential equations is done. And now please recall in the last video we have already shown that solutions for this system are global. This means they are defined on the whole real number line R if it's allowed, otherwise they are just defined on the whole interval I. So this is really important to remember because it means that solutions will not die early. Indeed, for every point in time that is possible, the solution will exist. And please don't forget this is special because this property we don't have for a general system of differential equations. Okay, and now for the second point here, we just need the meaning of the term autonomous, which we know is simply telling us that these two functions are constant. This makes everything much simpler because we only need one matrix and one vector for the whole system. And there maybe let's look at an example where we have a 2 times 2 matrix. Let's say we have 0, 1, minus 1, 0 for A and 1, 1 for B. So what we get is a vector field from R2 to R2 here on the right hand side, which means we could look at the directional field. And in this case it's easy to visualize because it's a picture in R2. And now we just have to put in some points into V of X. And as a reminder, this is simply a times x in the matrix multiplication plus the vector b. And maybe let's start here with the point 1, 0. This one gives us 1 in the first component and 0 in the second component. So our vector simply points to the right here. And with a similar thing we could also put in 0, minus 1. I do that because there we get the vector 0, 1 out. And moreover, you should immediately see if we put in 1, minus 1, we get out 0. Therefore you could say this is actually our origin. On the other hand, this immediately gives us a constant solution, so we have a fixed point there. And moreover, if we calculate some more points for the vector field, we even see more solutions. So for example, through the other points here we have marked, we find a circle as the orbit for the solution. It should be a nice circle, but as you can see my sketch was not perfect. But nevertheless, you should recognize 
that we find a lot of circles with different radii around this fixed point. And this means that these are all periodic solutions for our system. So these are definitely global solutions and we also recognize that we go around the circle in the clockwise direction if the time t increases. So our result here is that for an autonomous system the set of solutions might not be so complicated. And this is correct, we can quickly solve the problem for autonomous systems but we need much more work for the general case. And therefore it's often very helpful to first look at the corresponding homogeneous system for the general case. This simply means that we just ignore the vector b of t in the whole equation. So indeed it's a different ODE but it corresponds to the original one with the first part. And in fact it turns out that most information about the solutions is hidden in the matrix A of t. And we should immediately see the advantage we have in a homogeneous system because there we can use the full power of linear algebra. We just have the matrix vector multiplication here which is a linear map. So we should immediately see that linear combinations of solutions are possible. So more concretely just imagine that someone gives you two solutions of this system and let's call them alpha and beta. And then we can simply check if the addition of the two solutions is a solution again. So we just take alpha plus beta and calculate the derivative. Hence I put a big dot here to denote the derivative. And since differentiation is a linear operation we can also write alpha dot plus beta dot. And since alpha and beta are solutions we can also substitute this with the right hand side. So we simply get the matrix vector multiplication for alpha and beta here. And for the general matrix product we also have a linear property namely the distributive rule. So this is really natural we can just write a of t times alpha of t plus beta of t. And that's it there we see we also have a solution given by alpha plus beta. And now you can believe me that we can do the same calculation with a scalar lambda. So scaling a solution also gives us a solution again. So in general every linear combination of solutions is a solution again. So this is definitely an important fact you should remember for the homogeneous system. But please don't forget it's only valid for the linear homogeneous system here. You cannot just generalize it to any ODE. Now if you see this nice fact here and if you remember your linear algebra knowledge you might recognize that this solution set here forms a subspace. Indeed it should be a subspace in the vector space of continuous functions. And this should make the whole discussion much simpler because it means that we only need to calculate with a basis to describe all solutions. Therefore in the next proposition here we want to talk about the dimension of the solution set. And the assumption is always that we have a system of linear differential equations and then we look at the corresponding homogeneous part. And therefore I want to call this solution set here S0. This means in the set we find all possible functions alpha defined on the interval i that are continuously differentiable and that satisfy that the derivative is equal to a times alpha. And obviously we want to fulfill this equation for all t in i. So all possible solutions of our ODE here are found in this set S0. And now what we get for the homogeneous system is that this is an n-dimensional vector space. More precisely it's a real vector space so the scalars are given by the real numbers. If you think you have some problems with general vector spaces here you should definitely check out my abstract linear algebra series. There we discuss a lot of function spaces like this one. And now here you should recognize that this is a very nice result because it tells us that for an n-dimensional system the solution set is also n-dimensional. And this means if you can write down just n solutions which are linearly independent we actually have all the solutions. 
This makes everything much easier for us and therefore it's important that we prove this nice fact here. And for the first part, it's not hard to see that S0 is a vector space. Simply because it's a subset in a well-defined function space and we have shown this property here. This tells us that we cannot leave the subset with linear combinations and that actually tells us we have a subspace. Again, if you want to know more about that, this is discussed in my abstract linear algebra series. And moreover here, it does not matter what we choose for the surrounding bigger vector space. For example, we can choose C1. So the continuously differentiable functions defined on i form a vector space themselves. So in short, the linear structure of S0 is easy to see. Therefore, the actual question here is, how can we calculate the dimension of this space? Because the surrounding space here is definitely infinite dimensional. Compared to that, the solution set is of very low dimension. Therefore, we need a good idea to show the dimension of S0. And the good thing is that at this point in the course, we already have a lot of theory about ODEs. So for example, we have the pika lindeler theorem, which tells us that the initial value problem here has a unique solution. And in our case, the W here is given by the homogeneous system, so we only have A of T times X there. But still, what we get by pika lindelof is a unique solution. And indeed, we know it's defined on the whole interval I. And moreover, we have that alpha of t0 is x0. And exactly this property we can visualize in an extended phase portrait. I call it extended here because we have to include the time variable as well. This means we have a one-dimensional time variable here and an n-dimensional space variable there. And now you see one point in this plane represents an initial value t0 x0. Moreover, through this point, we find our unique solution curve of alpha. So for example, it could look like this, and we could actually call it the extended orbit of alpha. Again, I put the attribute extended to it to make sure that we don't forget the time variable. This means here in the set, we have t and alpha of t together. And then we just have to go through all the points t in the interval i. And as always, for the definition of the orbit, we have to choose the unique solution for the initial value problem. Hence, the extended orbits are well defined for every point, and because we have unique solutions, we don't have any crossings. So for example, the whole extended phase portrait here could look like this. And now we get a nice fact, since we have included the time variable here, we get that all the orbits go to the right hand side simply because we always mark what happens when t increases. In other words, also for non-autonomous systems, you can visualize orbits. Of course, we have some differences then. For example, a fixed point would be a constant solution, so a straight horizontal line here. However, this is all not so important for our proof here, because what we want is to use this visualization to get the dimension of S0. And the idea is simply to slice the portrait here at t0. This means we find a lot of different orbits starting at the same point in time. Hence, we can just project the whole orbits back to the space variable. So I want to define this new map and let's call it L. The input space is S0 and the output space is Rn. So we put a solution in and what comes out is simply the value of the solution at the point t0. So not a complicated definition, alpha is simply sent to alpha of t0. And now you should see, we have a vector space on the left hand side and one on the right hand side. So it's definitely allowed to ask if this forms a linear map. And indeed, this is not hard to show at all. We immediately see we can pull out the addition and scalars. Hence, this projection to the space Rn gives us a linear map. Moreover, the map is also surjective. Simply because every initial value problem here for a given x0 has a solution. 
so we can simply hit every x0. But on the other hand, the map L is also injective because we have the uniqueness. Just assume that L of alpha is equal to L of beta, and then we get alpha of t0 is equal to beta of t0, which simply means that they satisfy the same initial value problem. And now since we have the uniqueness, so there are no crossings of orbits in the picture, they actually describe the same orbit. Hence, the uniqueness implies that alpha and beta are actually the same on the whole interval i. And now you see, this is exactly the injectivity of the map L. The same images are only possible with the same input. So what we actually have here is a linear map that is also bijective. And in linear algebra we call such a nice map an isomorphism. It just tells us that we can translate between the two vector spaces back and forth without losing any information. Therefore, in conclusion, the dimension of the two vector spaces also has to be the same. There we have it, this finally gives us the dimension of S0. It's the dimension of Rn, which we know is simply n. So there we have it, the solution set of the homogeneous system is only n-dimensional. And this is a really helpful result for solving linear ODEs. And I would say we should immediately look at an example in the next video. So I really hope we meet again and have a nice day. Bye bye.